you're in charge and I start when I want. Is that correct? Okay, thank you. Um, so I think we're five minutes behind schedule, so oops, I'll start now. So thanks for those who are here. So some of you were probably, or possibly, in the room on Friday, uh, May the 25th, no, 2022, when there was a keynote given <coughs> by Nantes Université trying to say, okay, this is the story of a university that is trying to go open. So there were about six or seven people on stage at that moment, including the president, and they explained how the different aspects of openness were being addressed by a large uh, university in France and what it could imply perhaps for other people. So today, to explain what's happened with Lewis, 18 months later, there's only me. So I'm not sure that's a good omen, you know, if they say, no, you go and explain, you know. You, but actually, I think we have done a lot of things right and there's some things wrong, and I'm hoping to actually tell this story right now. So I've got some co-authors in preparing this slide, and especially Sandrine Gilly guichoux who, who took a lot of time preparing this. <clears throat> so the context. The context is La France. So some of you have been there. If I want to say something about it, it's just that we're quite far away from the sort of system we have here in Canada or that you can have at your neighbor's place in the United States. So La France is a place where there's uh, very many uh, public universities. Most of the education, higher education, takes place in the um, public universities, and these are funded by uh, public money, so that is by the taxpayer. I guess that's important to keep, and uh, the, the, the fees is 270 euros per year. So that's not the fee for one course, that's the fee for one university year. And there's perhaps you can pay a little bit more for other things, and there's some special schools that have got high fees. So this makes sense to, in the moment you're thinking about openness, right, it's perhaps not that same financial barrier that we have to break. There's other things that are involved, okay? Um, yes, perhaps also say we've got university libraries and they are highly supported. Meaning also that in France we don't necessarily have to go and buy textbooks. Most of my students will go through all their career without having ever bought one single textbook. Right, all the textbooks, they will go to the library, they will read from there, or they will pick some material that's on the web. So it makes it a little bit more interesting or challenging to actually convince people to go into where we are. Nevertheless, there are other issues, of course. So North University, I said, is a um, medium-sized university, rather large, 43,000, and uh, with different campuses in different parts of uh, France. Those who were there didn't actually get to see the chateau, which is a uh, part of the university. So uh, another thing that is now becoming common in the European universities is what's called the alliances, or the European universities. So there's a big challenge there. But um, the idea is to put a number, of, say a dozen, um, European universities from different countries together with a common project, with European funding, of course, to try and develop things like courses where students could move from one university to the other, or where you could get the same diploma in two very different universities. So we in Nantes are part of a consortium with some very nice universities in, uh, in the different countries. You can read here that there's a, a Germany, United Kingdom, uh, even if it's breakfast sit, you can find Sweden, you can find Spain, and so onwards. Uh, what's interesting is that there's money from Europe and there's tasks, and in those tasks, one of them is education. And so it's also a place where we can push the agenda of open education. Though there is international cooperation, one of them is what we've just said here, the fact of being inside UNIWEL, but not University has been involved with, uh, well, with a lot of people here for, for a while. We've been one of the first universities in France to join the OCW, now OEG movement. And uh, we're also very much involved with the UNESCO. I mean, I, I'm a UNESCO chair, and we've got, we've got, we've got a consistent a relationship with them. We're also a member of ICDE, and we've got special partnerships with a number of, um, of universities, including Cherbourg, who represented over there. OK, so the ambition of Nantes University, as expressed by the president last year, <coughs> is a holistic approach. It's not to just go one thing at the time. I could actually have a long discussion about this, but I think yesterday I heard somebody saying that's the right way to do things. You shouldn't just approach open education separately from open research, separately from whatever. It's true and it's not true. If you go for a holistic um, um, approach, you also end up by having to solve all sorts of problems before even getting started, right? Because people say, well, you know, we shouldn't start the open education until we've sorted the problems about open government. 
So, so in a way, it's also good to start something and then to get the other thing, things flowing. So the ambition, so this is just the sort of text that we will write, sort of saying we're open, we're sustainable, and we're excellent. Well, that's what we'd like to have as an ambition. So again, the ambition sort of through some pictures, saying that we're talking holistic means open science, open education, open innovation, open government with a set of tools like um, things like open communities and open educational resources, open spaces. These are things I will be, uh, I will be giving concrete examples about, but this is the sort of discourse we, uh, we, we are holding with uh, to, to give it a, a long-term um, uh, meaning. So the dates, this is not something that's been going on for 20 years. So the current president who, uh, president who gave the talk uh, last year has been elected only in 2019. And so very quickly she started doing things like creating positions. Instead of just saying that the vice rector or the vice president was vice president for education, that became very quickly vice president for education and open education. So the word open started really illustrating the different positions. So then we also had the UNESCO chair, which was um, around there, and a very important moment for, for us was organizing Open Education Global. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's something that works. I mean, if, you're, if you want your university to move forward, organize the conference, because suddenly people from the rest of the world arrive, and people who are not facing issues on, in open education will be seeing people around with who they can talk. So, so it works. This is something that really works. And perhaps the last one is, um, and I'll talk about, about this later, is that we're starting to actually get money to open, which is interesting. So little by little, at the beginning, the discourse of saying not university is an open university. Well, okay, people will listen to it politely, and then little by little, it interests at government levels. People saying, well, we should give this a chance, right? Everybody else is trying the usual stuff. These guys want to try something different. We should actually support them. And so I'm not saying money is pouring it. That would be completely wrong. But we are starting to receive... Um, money subsidies to, to, to open the university. So we, it, it all obviously helps because you do need people to do things. So the valuable starting point was the conference and uh, that conference, well, was, we felt was a success. I mean, we didn't have as many people as we're seeing around the, well, yes, no, we, all, we did have more people than in the room in this very moment, right? But in general for the conference, right, there was much more people here, but still there was a big crowd and there was a big crowd of European people, which, uh, which, which was also important for us. There is a, a clearly a necessity in countries like France to, to, to have relationships with their European partners. Okay, so what have we done since then? So this is, you know, have we been good boys? Have we, have we done something? So what we've been doing is doing all sorts of meetings, and the key word has been onboarding. Because it's very nice if the, the, at the top of the, the university there's a decision made, we shall now open, but you have to onboard everybody. You have to explain what it's about. So we've done all sorts of concrete things to try and onboard people. So what are the sort of things we do? Here's are three examples. So the first one is an activity where we created, and we've been running in various times, which is a hands-on activity, I create my first OER. I've left it in French because it is in French. So it's for during one hour and a half, we get them through the process. At the end of the process, the person have created a text with an image and have had to sort out a little um, dilemma with the licenses. Perhaps they've embedded a video. And it's been their, their job. So it's a way of saying, OK, well, I now have done one first OER. So that helps, and we can share it, even if it is in French, obviously. So the second one is when we started doing this, we found out we were actually spending a lot of time having to actually explain what OER are because it's not that obvious. And then we tried explaining what OER are and that didn't work either because you know if it's me talking about OER, people will listen politely, but I'm answering questions that they have not raised. So the idea is how do we get people to raise questions? So we invented this activity, which is a rather fun activity. I think we've got Melanie somewhere has got the card safe because people want to know what it's about. But basically, it's about pe putting people in groups and giving them uh, 10 priorities, reasons for which we should adopt OER, asking them to play a role. You're a student, you're a teacher, you're the minister of education, you're the dean, you're whatever. And so now put priorities on this. You know, say what matters, what between these reasons for adopting OER or open education matter and which don't. And that leads to brilliant debates where they have to you know, decide, okay, we're sacrificing the money issues, the cost issues, because we really think that the issues of sharing knowledge are more important. And, and then you can talk, and we're actually answering the questions they have raised themselves during the activity. So this works really well. We can show you, as I said, the cards if people are interested. 
And we actually also did it in Canada once. We did it in uh, Université de Laval. So other activities are more like design thinking activities. Again, the same idea is, suppose we have to onboard a non-university, how would you do it? Who will you put uh, in what activities? So that sort of activities, we sometimes only have three or four people, which is very disappointing. And in this case, I think there were, Melanie will correct me, but there could have been about 50 people that are doing this activity. So little by little, you know, the word gets around, people ask themselves the right questions, and we're sort of saying we've got some of the right answers. Okay, um, in parallel, so that's, let's say, the bottom-up approaches. The top-down approaches was this EU Newell we talked about before. Well, the first document this alliance signed was the declaration. So, you know, we did a nice big document saying, we the people, not quite, we the rectors of these universities proclaim that from now onwards we will blah, blah, blah. So I was in charge of the writing, which was nice. So, so and it was the first document this alliance actually um, signed. It's nothing exceptional, but it's a way of these people sort of about having this impression, or the, these important people, that this is the, um, the, the key, you know, this is going to be what, uh, what it's about, you know, what, what, what we can put forward. Okay, so then we've got other things related with open education. We've, got a, we've had webinars, we've got blogs and things of that sort. So we're still working and doing all sorts of little things. I mean, it's not about just one activity. There's lots of activities going on in the university. And as I said before, and that's the last line, this is not my slide, but the last line is September, um, we did get a big grant. So there's a lot of money. So we're hoping to be able to get forward. But it's not just about the money. It's about two things. It's about the university gambling their capacity of asking for money based on the open idea. You know, they're not going to have more than one card. You can't go out with two projects to the ministry. So they said, no, okay, we're all going, this is our card. This is what our Trump is. We're, we're playing with open as Trumps. And, and that matters a lot because people start thinking, okay, university is choosing this. This matters. And the second thing is also when you do get the money, it means that you've convinced at the other end. And so that, for the national authorities, is, is a good sign. It means that these ideas uh, are working. This has not always been true. I mean, three years ago, or two years ago, I remember that we uh, already tried to go for a project based on open education, in, or openness in general. And uh, when we went for the interview, or the discussion with the jury, the questions of the jury were just, I'm sorry to say, frankly stupid and showed that they didn't have any idea about this. It was just, you know, we were some sort of left-wing activists that were trying to say, let's have everything for free with uh, public, public money. I mean, uh, they hadn't understood that there was an actual construction behind this. And things have changed. I mean, so we are convincing, and this is good. Right. So that's what some of the things we've been doing. So now what are we doing? So now what's going to happen from now onwards? And now that we've got the money to go on, well, it's again, we're trying to go for open spaces, go and do so these open and free educational resources, open it to communities in practice. So a number of, of projects where we either um, build and distribute where we are, or we train and uh, help the teachers to, to try and, uh, and go and adopt these things. So um, here's some of the examples of the things that are happening just in the next few months. We're creating an OER factory, talk about it in a second. We're uh, also creating a platform so that once we've created some OER, we put it in the right place. Surprisingly or not, we didn't have that. So people would create OER, but then perhaps have them on their own web pages or over the place. So we had to do that. And then we start, we're even holding now in a few days in December an Open Education Week. It's a small event, but it's a way to get the ball rolling and also to have the university reflect upon what we're doing. And there's a number of things happening there. I'm going to also talk about Open Madoc. So La Fabrique des Rails, as it's called in French, is actually a title we have pinched from people in Quebec who have got a fabrique, a successful Fabrique des Rails running for now three years, two years and three, four years, okay, for four years. And the idea is to have a place where they actually not only learn how to do where we are, but they actually they put together, and this is the critical idea that they already presented last year in, in during the talks, they put together the librarians and um, counselors and they always need these two people to work together with the professor, which then makes that the knowledge, the know-how, is, is spread in a better way. So we're having one of those. We're starting it now-ish. I mean, as I said, before December. So the first thing you start doing is, of course, finding stuff that you've already been putting on web pages left, right, and center, and try and sort of just check that they fit the format. And hopefully, by next year, we will be actually producing new where we are. 
The second one is having an OER collection. So again, we're trying to find examples elsewhere. So I, I think we're in the spirit of openness, which is you find a good example somewhere. In this case, it would be Université de Louvain in Belgium. And they've, had a, they've got a successful, well-managed collection, and they've dealt with a number of problems that you usually have with this. It's basically based on DSpace, but it's still going to uh, be used as an example, and we're hoping to launch it, well, we are launching it in, in December. The third thing, which is a, it might sound trivial, this is not about OER, this is just about openness. So, like many countries, we've got Moodle, or like many universities. But our Moodle is not very open. Our Moodle is closed by the teachers, by all sorts of security issues, and I can't know what the teacher next door is actually doing. I teach machine learning. If in mathematics there's somebody teaching machine learning, I can't know what he... It's not true. I can ask him. If I ask him permission, he may grant it or not. And it has happened before that the teacher will say, no, I don't grant it. You're not part of my pupils. So the idea is to, at least internally, start getting into the habit of having a first layer of openness, which is the layer of openness between us, between us and between our, our pupils. I know it's something that for some of you who are doing that for ages, it might sound trivial. It is not trivial. It is so difficult to put. We have got barriers and barriers of people who aren't going to express uh, immediately what they're doing, but who are, um, why they are blocking things. But there's huge uh, ideas to block it. So the idea isn't to oblige everybody. The idea is to be open by default. I think uh, that was one of the expressions that was used yesterday. I mean, you know, anybody is allowed to say, no, I don't want anybody to look at what, what I'm doing. But at least it's a decision, and it's a publicly made decision that the person might be questioned upon. But even without getting to the question, it just means that being open by default becomes the thing. So if we just do that, that is going to be, in my view, perhaps the biggest game changer for how people start working inside the university. And if people have got advices on how we should do this without having a, you know, another French Revolution, I mean, I'm prepared to take the, 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 the ideas. So inside UniWell, uh, the good news is that there's a work package. Inside the work package which belongs or which is run by NOD, there's actually something called T7.7, you can see here, which is UniWell Open Education. So there is an idea adopted by this alliance to go open. So it's a good idea. NOD pushing the agenda is able also to push the agenda in 10 other universities, which is also uh, uh, interesting. Uh, again, I'm, I'm probably in charge of that. But I don't have a clue how it's going to work. We're going to try. So very next, very next, very next, not many things uh, happening here. So very next, the open educational research. Yeah, so one of the things we've been noticing is, um, at least in France, we don't have enough of that. Not enough researchers in investigating, looking at the issues of, of um, open education research. Here I was lucky to move from room to room, and I tried to go as much as I could, not to the policy rooms, but to the research rooms. And it was great to see all the different activities that some subgroups were actually doing in research. Obviously, GoGN is the best example of what research can be about. But um, the research agenda in open education, in my view, is not clear. Right? There's going to be subgroups, might be the social sciences working very hard in their direction, but what about the economy, right? or what about the links with artificial intelligence, again, in research? And so the, we're hoping to use this, and the first thing we need to work on is on the uh, research agenda. So we're going to do this a first um, time here now in December 2023 with a two-day symposium in Nantes. It's going to be in French. Uh, that's another one of my hobbies, some of the, you might remember from last year. I'm very keen on multilingualism, so in this case it will be in French. We might have another workshop, who knows, in Spanish at another moment. But we have to sort of um, get into working on, on topics in different languages to, to bring different people on the, uh, to the table, especially in research. Okay, and it's also a concern of the unity network I was speaking about yesterday. Okay, this is just a messy slide where you can see lots of partners, just to say that it is important in this thing to not, um, not be um, isolated. So NOT is uh, open for collaborations, is already collaborating in all sorts of ways. And what we're most interested in is in people or universities that have 
you know, there are perhaps a few steps ahead of us who've already achieved a certain number of things. So it's not about having an expert group of two, three people moving very fast or one department. Here the issue is the whole university, trying to bring a university, which is a standard university, to a degree of openness that is not at all common in the French universities. It is a huge challenge. So we're certainly help, um, I'm looking forward for any, any help will be, will be welcome. Okay, now these are just some nice little pictures, if not, to finish my talk. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so the, that's two, where's the half? Uh, the, where, how did this turn out? That's the half. Okay, so, uh, well, let's start with the second one. We did give a talk on day one in the room there, which is exactly what we're trying to do. So um, we're not using machine learning. What we're using is going straight for the beast, using ChatGPT and uh, different um, uh, AI alternatives to try and sort of, if not generate OER, generate parts of the OER that we need to actually get somewhere. Well, we do have other projects, one called Clara, which is a project where ideally, let's give you, give you the, the, the deal, you're a teacher, you write your uh, synthesis of what you want to do, you know, your, your, your uh, syllabus, you press on a magic button, and this becomes a query to uh, knowledge base in which you then receive things like saying, okay, for this chapter, you should use this and this. For this other chapter, you should use this and this. So, so this is a running project. Uh, hopefully, I might even talk about it next year. But we, we are doing that. So, so yes, we've got all sorts of uh, projects where we're trying to use either machine learning or artificial intelligence to not yet to produce OER, but more to sort of take those bits of OER that are already there and to somehow combine them to, 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 pr to produce courseware. And so then the first question was about uh, what are our um, uh, objectives re-OER? To be fair, um, I'm a big fan of OER, but the university thinks that open education, and I think they're right, right, uh, is more important than OER. The bigger picture in for a university is not to produce OER or to get an OER ad adopted. The bigger picture is really to make sure that the teachers become, or the professors or whatever, become uh, open educators. That's much more important. Um, the Moodle example is just trivial. I mean, I've got great hair. But I, I believe the university in France is less open today than it was 40 years ago. And this is what Internet has achieved. It's very disappointing. Right? All we've done is close things that before I could go into the coffee room and uh, I could pick up the, the, whatever, the, the courseware by my different colleagues. Today, I cannot get access to the courseware of my colleagues. I went to a meeting uh, two years ago, I remember it was to prepare the next edition of the Masters. And so we sat there and the documents that were distributed to us was the syllabus we had written five years ago. And we all said, but you know, we've all changed, that's not what we're doing. And the guy who's in charge of the course said, well, that's all I've got. Okay, so when it, it's just so bad for the decision making process for all the, the, the what we call pedagogic teams and whatever, we have to open up. So that's more urgent. So in this case, I would say that the goals of the OER, they are written about how many. We've still got to discuss the quality issues. Those are very important. But uh, there are some numbers. I mean, there are some numbers, which is a progression, I don't remember, of producing five, then 20, then 50 per year. There's some numbers. I, I believe they're magic numbers. I don't think that they, they matter so much. Yeah. Difficult advantage, and I wonder if your goal is including students in 
No, absolutely. One of the other case examples is we've got a problem in France. The students make loose choices when it comes to go into university. One of the drawbacks, if anything, of the university being cheap is that somehow they perhaps don't take the same energy to make the right choices when they go into it because, because of what all sorts of reasons. And so then they'll find themselves in the first few weeks finding out that they're in the wrong um, thing, they're enrolled in the wrong place. And I just found out when I was speaking to these students that were having to re-choose that they had access to exactly the same information that they had when they were in high school. They didn't have access to say, well, go and have a look what's happening in that room over there. Or, you know, you've chosen physics, but really you could choose chemistry. But for that, we have to open the, the curriculums. We have to understand what's happening. So, yeah, that's one of the examples. But the best example isn't that. It isn't even from us. The best example is an example from Politecnico Milano in Italy. I think it's a beautiful example where they've made open, not only inside to their own uh, pupils, but to the pupils in high school. So when they're in high school, they are able to make decisions on what they're going to do next year based on that. And they even get encouraged with the teachers in the high school to start preparing the lectures. And they're, this is what we call in French, la cerise sur le gâteau, you know, the, the, the really, the, the, the big advantage, is as soon as they arrive, they're allowed to take the exams. They don't even have to go through the studies because they've been able to study the material in advance and they gain whatever that means, perhaps you know, two or three credits through that. I think it's a brilliant example. And that only works because you're going through an open education, open education resources um, project. Um, well, one of my favorite examples. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, and it's a difficult one. Thank you, thank you for a bad question. Right? Uh, no, there's, lo there's, lo there's, lo there's lots of little moments of, of happiness. Obviously, you're happy when, as I said, you know, when a lot of money pours in because you know you're going to be able to do things, but more because of the two reasons I was saying before. Just because it really shows that it's not just... Um, a commitment, you know, something you say for policy, but it's something that really matters both the university and in this moment I'm seeing how it's starting to matter at national level. So those are probably my, my, my biggest happiness. But then we've got a great team, so we're just working with the people, it makes it nice. Well, there are two other parts to your sort of civil monitoring. Yeah. One was uh, open innovation and another was open government. Yeah. I'd say that uh, I'd say two things. Um, uh, a bit what I said, said before. The problem is that when you're too holistic, things get jammed. So for open education, it's much more complicated because you've actually got to be working with the companies and with the outside world. So, so, so the rhythm at which you can do things will depend on your capacity to sign contracts and to sign things. So for the moment. Um, we do know uh, we're in places, for example, they've moved us to a part of town where we are in contact, not just with the university people, but also with the outside world and also with the companies. So there's a lot of meetings happening. So I, I would say we're going in the right direction. We're starting to have um, courseware that we're trying to use in um, different settings to do different things. Um, we're not good at sort of coming out with saying, look, let's see if this software to do multilingualism, we should start do a startup with it, for example. That we, we showed to not be capable of doing. Um, and as far as governments go and open governments, um, pass. I mean, I, uh, I, I, I like the idea, and I think we should... Uh, no, not pass. I can do something about it when it comes to open education, and in that setting, I will certainly do something about it. But when you're starting to talk about open government or open democracy, you're clearly going to go up into the higher spheres of the university. So 
past means that. I mean, I'm going to encourage them to do things, but you're right. In the case of open education, we, we, we should involve in a different way the people. You're right. So, so yes, I mean, in one critical sector, which is the medical sector, there is a huge open data um, uh, initiative for France with all the particularities of the medical data where you can't be just completely open. So you have to do a number of things, but that teaches you what works and what doesn't work. So, so there are things happening. So that's uh, as far as open data, I would say in that, uh, in that, in that setting there is. And uh, as far as open research, it is on the agenda, and there is a vice president of um, for research and open access. So it's part of his mandate, and um, things are, are happening there. But again, it's, it's very difficult where uh, all what Cable was saying about the, 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 if you, you know, the publish and perish system and the fact that you need your publications in just those journals that are the wrong ones, we have got all that. But um, yeah, Hope, being holistic means we have to address that also, yes. I'm not sure we've got time. Is the next speaker here or are we on coffee break afterwards? She's here. So you tell me off if you want me to stop. So we're done. So she told me to stop. Okay. Thank you.